our seniors. Thank you so much for ministering to us in song. And also, we want to say thank you to our cooks. Yeah, Brother Thankton and Brother Clay, man alive. If we keep eating at the church, I'm going to be stagordo temprano. I'm going to be real fat fast. <laughs> Woo. Too much good food. I ate till I thought, well, I'm going to get to preach for keep eating. <laughs> but save me a piece of cake, mama. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> We're so proud you could say those of you that could. Thank you so much. I was telling La Crystal whenever she was coming out the door, I said, "Honey, we was praying for you Wednesday evening, and to see her come back this morning. It's just such a blessing back for evening service. We thank you so much. It was a privilege to have my mom. I didn't know she's going to get to be here. She talked like this going to to uh, Lubbock. I was proud to have her in the house of the Lord. She's made it over to the assisted living. Had a had a neat time there, and uh, we're just thankful. What a what a, what a wonderful Easter." Look with us, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse number 9. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse number 9. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, and after I read this to you, you'll know why he's crying. This bunch of people is hard to bend. They're stiff in the neck and hard in the heart. But there is an answer. Amen. There always has been. Never been a day there wasn't an answer. There's always been an answer there. And that answer is that Jesus that come out of the grave. Woo! Yes. Hallelujah. Here in Jeb and, uh, Jeremiah 17 and verse number 9 we'll start reading. Down through about, we're going to look at about down through 14, chapter 9. Okay, here we go. Uh, chapter 17, verse number 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And who can know it? That might not seem like much, but whenever you think you're following your heart, your heart's crooked. We, we used to have a person in the church years ago, that, and it's gone now, but say, well, if I know my heart, this is what I think. You don't know your heart. No, you don't. The Bible says you don't know it. It's desperately wicked, and who can know it? Ain't nobody knows it but God. He knows it. And that's why we want to take it to him. Verse number 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. As the partridge setteth on eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days. That's that gambling bunch. And at his end shall be a fool. A glorious high throne from the beginning of the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed. And they that depart from me shall be written in the earth. That means your name is not in the book. Because they have forsaken the Lord. And notice these words here. The Lord, the what? The fountain of living waters. In verse number 14 he says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. In St. John chapter 4 and verse number 9, I was telling Sister Leatherwood after services, thank you for chasing me through the scriptures. Man, I mean, I won't no more say it. She's got her nail down up there. I appreciate it. It's one, it didn't want to read it off the deal. Where you, I mean, you got it. It's straight away. Here in St. John chapter 4 and verse number 9, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me? Which am a woman of Samaria, and the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou, would, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou knowest, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast, that living, hast thou that living water? Verse number 12, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting 
life in St. John chapter 7 and verse number 37. In St. John chapter 7 and verse number 37 and 38, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man, notice this word, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Brother Chris was talking about a, a lady that, that has been one just recently. She had, had, had invited her to the walk and she'd give her heart to the Lord. And she just, and he said, she's going on because she's hungry. This is equal. This is the same drive. Thirst, hunger, that's that craving. You want more, you can't get enough of it. Yeah. You're, on a, you're, you're addicted to Jesus. Woo! Are you out there? How many's ever had an addiction before? But you get addicted to Christ, not Dr. Pepper or powder snuff or come on now, or alcohol or crack or meth or marijuana. Come on now, somebody. Surely you're still out there in the building. Yeah. Somebody, Lord, look at what it says. He that believes on me, the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Woo! But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that should believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Lord, we just ask you to take these precious words this evening. And this wonderful group of people, Lord, that's vowed themselves to you and come back again this evening early for services, Lord. We thank you for the food. We thank you for your resurrection power. And we thank you for your availableness to us today. We praise you for that in the name of Jesus. Everyone said. Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you just a little bit from this 14th or the 17th chapter of Jeremiah, the 4th chapter of John, and the 7th chapter of John. I said, Ooh, this is going to be a long message. And I'll, try to, I'll try to spool it in over here in just a little bit. I want, out, of, out of Jeremiah 17 and verse number 13, uh, he says, he talks about the Lord, and then he says, the Lord, the fountain of living waters. They've forsaken something. What have they forsaken? The Lord, the fountain of living waters. In chapter 7, or chapter 4, he's talking to the woman about not drinking just the water out of Jacob's well, but taking a drink of Jesus. That's really what it boils down to, that Jesus is likening himself to water. In, in John chapter 7, verse 37, 38, he's saying, if any man's thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. And then that's going to cause a well springing up. There's a reason that Sister Cheeks got a testimony. It's because that well has started springing up on the inside of her herself. And I, I, re, I remember, uh, it's been a few months ago, but Daniel and some of the young people had, had been in the upper room classes or the, the I don't know if as a hand and feet of where it all happened, but I mean, they come down the hall, 10 or 12 of them, and the Holy Ghost had come in. The, Daniel, you remember that? <laughs> had come in on them, boy. They're still shouting, praising God, and crying, coming down the hall, coming into my office. I mean, the power of the Lord, all of them. Where does that come from? That's because you've been drinking from the fountain. And so I want to talk to you just a little bit that there is life. If you want to live, there is life in the fountain. It's there. There is life in the fountain. And what gets me about Jesus is his willingness to become as common, and notice this next word, as common and as necessary as a drink of water. How long can you live without liquid? You, you've got to, your body's up in the 90% of water. You take the water out of the body, it's just a little old shriveled up sack that's just, I mean, it's just empty. It's gone. The same way with us, we must have Jesus. And Jesus is willing to fit that must. And he's saying to us, he's willingness to become as common as a drink of water and as necessary as a drink of water. That servanthood and at its highest level. He talks about here uh, in this verse, the uselessness, in ver look at verse number 13, all that forsake me shall be ashamed. You know why? <coughs> they starved to death for water. 
It's available, but they don't want it. They think it's somewhere else. Water's everywhere, but they won't drink the water. And Jesus is available. Friends, He is omnipresent. There's nowhere on this planet you can go that you can't find Jesus. You can be out in the desert in the Sahara. If you knew enough to, to, to repent, you could be saved right there. You could be in Africa, or you can, you can name any far-fetched country. Out on the ocean, in between two continents, and you could still find Jesus there. Jesus is wherever you call upon Him. He's available to you. And He's just as available as water is. The Lord, the fountain of living water. So there is life in this fountain. And so it's useless, it's useless to die by thirst. Whenever water is everywhere. I visited with the man for quite some time, and I mean, he had done two or three uh, stints in the jail. At this time, whenever he called me, which he had never done before, every time, yeah, I'm going to get right, I'm going to all this, I mean, he, he, always, but he'd just go right back. As quick as he got back, he, he'd go right back into dope and, and uh, all the stuff that had, had got him in jail before. And this time when he got out, he called me and he said, I'm ready. I want to I wanna turn the corner. I thought, wow, after all those years of his young teenage life, young 20s, and he's nearly 40 years old, and finally the light come on. And he says, now I'm hungry. For Friend, I just want you to know that Jesus is available. I mean, there's not a day you live that Jesus has not got his arms out. And he's begging you to come. And he says, I'm just, I'm willing to be just like a drink of water. Just come on in and get some of this. He makes no, no high tenor to the woman there, this, at the, uh, the woman at the well. He says, all you got to do is ask for a drink. She's after water. He said, that's what I am. Ask of me. I'm going to fulfill that drink in your life. Some years ago, I was shooting some horses for Miss Junior Orledge. And Daddy had set a jug over in the back of my pickup. You'll enjoy this cutter. <laughs> he, had, he had a gallon jug that was wrapped in a tow sack. And he filled it up with water out of his well. And he always called the well there at our house where I was raised at, the well of Bethlehem. And he set that he set that jug over in there had a had a ba, had a bailing war hook on it. He had it by the bailing war, and he said over in the back of that pickup. He said, "Right after dinner, that'll look good." <laughs> and so it was nearly dark, you know. I mean, I was, I was leaving out early in the morning, going to go down there and shoe them horses. I had about eight or ten head to shoe down on that ranch between uh, that, that was over there close to uh, Robert Lee. Anyway, I got down there. I shot five or six head before lunch. Went in and they feed you on, on those ranches. I mean, they feed you till you just almost burst, boy. I mean, I drank and I, I, I went back out there. It was sure was rough to go back and go to shoot horses again. <laughs> I had about three or four left to shoot that evening. I was like, ah! <laughs> well, I got, I got two or three of them done. And man, I mean, I just, it was a summer day and I just wet with water. And I reached over and got that jug and sat down on the tailgate. And I turned that jug up. I was drinking. A lot, they was watching me. I didn't know they was watching me from the house. Well, there was one of those men I had worked with when I ran that range down there. And he's the same age I was. And so here he comes. He comes right out there. And I mean, he got his hat on and everything. He comes down there and he says, ah, I would like to know. What's in that jug? <laughs> he thought I was drinking some snops or something. You know? <laughs> I, said, I said, well, my daddy said that that's water right out of the well of Bethlehem. And uh, he said, well, could I have some? I said, well, sure, you can have some. No, <laughs> so, man, I mean, that's before bottled water. <laughs> I mean, man, he got, that, he got that jug and he turned it up and he just, I mean, it's like his eyes just, whoo. It was still wet where Daddy had watered it down and cool. He got him a big drink of that. I mean, he pulled that jug down and he said, that is good. Friends, that's why it's useless. You're wasting your life not to live for Jesus because he's so available and he's so in the servanthood. And he says here in verse number 13, all that forsake me shall be ashamed. Why would you leave God when he's made it so available for us to come to him? It's not like there's no water available. It's the depraved mind of man that doesn't think Christ the fountain of life is the answer but he is you come to Jesus all of those other needs and questions that you feel like can't be answered are answered by Jesus Christ he's there available to meet your need 
in Acts chapter 26 and verse number 28, Paul has been preaching his heart out to King Agrippa, and his wife is there with them, Bernice, and he's told them his story. And then he asked them to come and make things right with God. And the scripture gives this answer from Agrippa. Agrippa says, almost, Paul, thou persuadest me to be a Christian. He got him so close to drinking the water of Christ, but he never crossed over. No place in the Bible that he ever went and just said, okay, I'm going to get that done. So Paul, Paul almost made him want to drink of, of that fountain of the water of life freely. In John chapter 12 and verse number 37, the scripture says, though he had done many miracles, yet they believed not on him. He made himself available to people in every way. Just look at the lives that's been changed right here in this room. Listen to the testimony of Sister Cheek that was just given a year ago. And, and to now, and, and, and the growth that she's made in the coming around, out of sin, into the righteousness of God. Oh, what great rejoicing it brings us to know that there is life there. We can go and find Christ as we drink of that water of the fountain of life. The second thing in this passage is verse number 14. I'd like for us to look at in Jeremiah 17 and 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. <coughs> Healing is such a wonderful thing. It's a blessing that's brought on by God Almighty. He told the Syrophoenician woman that healing is the children's bread, and it's ours for the taking. Heal me, and I shall be healed. In Luke chapter 4, verse number 18, it says, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. That's his business. That's what he wants to do. He is that water. And it's, it's not just, you know, we used to plow with a, on an open uh, tractor with no, no well, sometimes they had a shade on them. But in, in, the, in midsummer, if you're out there plowing all day long, you can see the heat waves off of that muffler right in front of you. I mean, the heat's just pouring off of that thing. And uh, you look out across the, the country, and, and you'll, you'll see, um, especially in August, there, there'll be these waves out there, and it's heat waves way out there, and it looks almost like water. Jesus is not a mirage. Boy, you'll be sitting up there on that tractor wanting to drink of water so bad, or wish you had filled your water jug, you got it hanging on the hanging on the side of the tractor there and you didn't fill it up before you left. Who needs water when you're leaving? You just got through drinking. But I mean about mid-afternoon you said, where's the water at? I love to think about Jesus. He's not a mirage. He's there. Yeah. Help me, Scott. Look at him. He's, he's preaching with me. <laughs> Heal me. Heal me, he says, and I shall be healed. Worldly water is contaminated. Would you say it with me? Worldly water is contaminated. You may drink of it and it may feel your thirst for a season, but after a while you'll vomit up that morsel of the world that you swallow down. It'll take more out of your life than you want to give. It'll cost you more than you want to pay, and it'll keep you longer than you want to stay. I remember we was at the orphanage there in Old Mexico. And uh, Brother Foster had watched this truck over the two or three days that we was there haul sewage off. Sewer down there, I don't know where that's dumping it, probably in the, in the Rio Grande. Anyway, in a little while, the same truck comes back, and he's got a load of fresh water on the same truck. And he hooks up to their water tank, and that, there's one of those young boys goes running over there, one of those young boys that was raised right there in Old Mexico, turns the water hydrant on and starts drinking from the water. And Mike, I watched him from way back there. He's running, he's talking to English. This kid's looking at this guy going... <laughs> and Mike is telling him, that water is contaminated. That water's dirty. And that little guy, look, look at this guy, he can't, he can't hip it. He's just, that little kid just laughing at him and he drank it. He drinks it full and he throws the deal down and cuts it off. Out of the same deal, worldly water is contaminated. You may think it's all right. You may have drank it your whole life. But I want to tell you, friends, after a while, that stuff, will, it'll take you down. Uh, we, we was getting some goats one time for a barbecue. Me and a buddy of mine. <laughs> down between Black One Mary and Neil, I'd call him. Man, he's a good roper, and he's, I don't know, he's about 60. But I just love this guy. His name was Taylor Wilson. <laughs> and uh, we'd, we'd rope four or five goats, and we was after some more. And anyway, when we got through, we went back by. He said, he's thirsty. Uh, and I said, man, I am too. I said, let's go up there. I said, there's a big old reservoir. I said, we just lean over our horses and drank out of the reservoir. The trough, you know, it's where the cows drank. It, that comes out of the bottom of the reservoir and goes in there to the cows. 
And so he said, yeah, that'll work. Well, so we, we went over and, and I remember he, he was right in front of me and we both just leaned over off our horses on them big old concrete tanks and we, just, we was drinking that water like crazy. And all of a sudden I heard him, he started kind of throwing up and gagging. And uh, he said, ah! <laughs> He's trying to spit that water out. <laughs> I said, what's wrong with you? He said, look down in the bottom of that tank. <laughs> Well, I got up and I got to looking and there was a buzzard in the bottom of that reservoir was a buzzard and he'd been there so long he'd just disintegrated. <laughs> but guess what? It didn't kill us. <laughs> we prayed over it <laughs> and got by. But the water that I'm talking to you about, this holy water, it's not contaminated. It's clean and it's wonderful and it's offered by Jesus himself. It is this Christ. Heal me and I shall I'll be healed, he says. In Psalm chapter 41, and verse number 4, he said, The Lord be merciful unto me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. Who hasn't been there and sinned before God? Please forgive us. We've got that buzzing water in us. <laughs> Woo! We're contaminated. We may have some sore in our system. God, wash us out. Hey! In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse number 22, he says, return, and I'll do something for you. I'll heal your backslidings. Woo! You've been a slide backer for a long time. Sister, Sister Cheek was talking about she got off of smokes, and in a little while she got back on them. Said, ah! <laughs> but guess what? By and by. Yeah! Yeah, look at her. Her hand's up there now. Had my last one by the grace of God. Friends, somewhere, you got to come out on top. Heal me. I shall be healed. Heal my soul. Heal my backsliding, God. What's it take? It's just like a drink of water. Go to Jesus. Believe God to set the difference in your life. In Hosea chapter 6, this entire book of Hosea is about Israel backsliding and coming back to Christ or invited back. But here about midterm in Hosea chapter 6 and verse number 1, look at this, look at this writing. Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. There's something real neat about gathering cows. If you're out in a big pasture and, and they'll take you to the backside and just drop you off and then you start, you start gathering. The cattle you pick up, you know where they go first? They go to the water hole. It doesn't, it doesn't, wherever the water is in front of you, normally the cow just get up and they'll go because that's the last place they've been. They, they eat grass and then they go drink. And they eat grass and they go drink. They got water's a must. And so if you'll let them, if you'll let cattle, it's even hard to drive. If you'll go ahead and let them go to the water hole, once they get there, they say, okay, I'm good now. Then you can drive them off. But sometimes if you don't let them go there, they'll fight you. They'll try to go back because they're thinking, I got to go to the water hole first. Wouldn't it be neat if there was something in us that says, before I get anything else done, I'm going. To the water. Come on, Sky, help me a little bit now. I'm going to get some water somehow, Lord. You ain't driving me off. So you tell the devil on Sunday morning, I'm going to the water hole. And Sunday night, I'm going to go get me some water. And Wednesday, he says, Yeah, I'm going back down. Yeah, you ain't driving me nowhere, devil. I'm so busy. I got to go to that water hole first. Heal me, Lord, and I shall be healed. Return. He talks about us bringing us back in Hebrews chapter. 12 verses 12 and 13 he says wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees verse 13 says and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way but let it rather be healed friends if you've been an up and downer for a long time let today this Easter Sunday be your time to say Lord I've walked back my last trip I'm, I'm going to take this now I've been an up and downer in and outer I'm going to get serious about serving Jesus so serious I'm going to stay on the water until I get what God has called me to be, an overcomer. He wants us to have a testimony that, yeah, I was there, but I'm not there no more by the grace of God. I'm coming out because the Lord is helping me. So he talks about us, lift up the hands that hang down, the feeble knees, and make straight paths. Let's but he said, he, let it be turned from the way, but he'd rather that it be healed. There was a gentleman give me a testimony. His name was Richard Martin. 
Y'all remember Sister McCann, don't you? This boy went to the doctor, and the doctor had told him that he had tumors in his colon. It's been quite some time back. Sister McCann came, prayed for him, laid her hands on him. He went back to the, the doctor, and the doctor couldn't find nothing. <laughs> Don't you love this Jesus? Heal me and I shall be healed. Woo. How many in this building has had a healing from the Lord sometime? Yes. Physically and spiritually. I mean, aren't, aren't we blessed? Man, so powerful blessed. I guess one of the first times I was really touched by healing virtue, there was a young man in our that was there at our house. He was a couple of years older and older than me and Randy or three, three or four. Anyway, his name was David Gould. We were outside sharpening the holes, and he was kind of putting the last, uh, the last sharpener on. He was older. He knew how to handle the file a little better. I was probably 12 or something like that, and Randy 14. That put him about 16. Anyway, uh, just as we were finishing the last hole, he cut, he, he slipped, and his hand just goes across that hole like that. I mean, them things was down just almost razor, you know, for a little bit. And it just, it just laid it down. I mean, bleed. He couldn't stop it. And we got it, we got it in there in the house, got him in the house, and, and, uh, we had him over the laboratory and running water over and everything. And the mama started quoting that scripture in Ezekiel chapter 6. Wow. I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, to live. And I, I mean, as I stand before you, I watched that thing just be just sealed off. Yep. They, and they wrapped it up. We went back to hole. And I thought, oh, anybody now, they would, oh, call the ambulance and, and the doctor. And we got to get him sold. I don't know if he ever got it sold up. I mean, that thing just, just is crazy. But I just think about the Lord. What a mighty God we're serving. As a, as a young child boy, I mean, that just set a precedence in my, in my heart. Another time, uh, Randy's, Randy's heels, that he just little in. He's probably eight or nine. But his heels would crack open in the wintertime. His, his skin would get real dry and crack open. He'd just walk on his tiptoes. I mean, he'd get up in the morning walking on his tiptoes. He couldn't stand up his feet to the ground. If he did, them things just opened up more. My grandma got him up in her lap and prayed for them heels, rubbed them and prayed for them, turned him loose. He never had no cracks. It said, I mean, the power of God. That just marks your heart that, Lord, you're out there. Not only, what about the, the spiritual healing he does in our life where we'll be, we'll be different people. Man, so, so wonderful. How God deals with us in John chapter 5, back to the water. John chapter 5 and verse number 2. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of something. What are they waiting for? They're waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain session or season in the, into the pool and troubled the waters. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he has. I'm talking to you about a Jesus. He has become this water at the pool of Bethesda. You come to him. You believe him. And friends, I'm going to tell you, your, your healing is going to come physically, spiritually, financially, mentally. He knows how to bring stuff all back into your life to where you say, hey, I'm, I'm going to make it. It don't matter if you're young or old or up or down, rich or poor. You come to Christ, he's going to begin to build you and make you what you've never been before without him. Jesus is that fountain. He is that water. That's what he is for us. He's our great healer. Back in Jeremiah 17, verse number 14, he says, not only does he do healing on us, but I think this is precious. Look what it says. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. And he says, save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Man, Jesus today, his resurrection is all about our salvation. So precious. He heals us, but man, our salvation means so much. <clears throat> save me, and I shall be saved. Salvation replaces failure with hope. Woo. Man, who among us hasn't had failure? I was in the Coliseum several years ago, and a gentleman from Hammond, Indiana, was preaching there. He pastored a church of about six or 8,000 people. I was trying to call his name. I, re I remember him so vividly. But the, the message he preached was, failed, but not a failure. And he told us that night as he was preaching, 
He said, everybody has failed. What makes you a failure is if you allow that to be the last chapter in your book. He said, if, you're, if you failed right up to now as a mom, as a dad, as a husband, as a wife, uh, if, if you failed as a, as a mother or a son or a daughter, however you failed, you come to Jesus and say, Lord, start writing me a new chapter and start right now tonight. Failed, but not a failure. Look what salvation does. It brings failure over to hope and it builds into our lives. It takes sin and it, it gives us forgiveness. That's what salvation replaces sin with forgiveness. Salvation replaces damnation with divine acceptance. Instead of being eternally excluded, we're brought into the presence of God. All that water, he says that this is that fountain of life in our soul that speaks into our hearts. There is life in the this fountain called Jesus. He's there. He's available. He's waiting on us. To the lost, he becomes the found. He finds us and, and we're no longer out away from God. He talks about eternal death, but he also talks about eternal life and that all comes through salvation. Whosoever believeth on him leaves eternal death for eternal life. I was listening to a Baptist preacher years ago. Was driving, I was driving an old tractor, a 670 Super Moline. It had all the accommodations on it. A steering wheel, brakes, power lift, and a radio. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bunch. No cab or nothing like that. No hair. I mean, let's talk about a tractor the other day. It had a, had a TV in it. <laughs> that wouldn't have worked when I was playing. I bet you see it. <laughs> now, anyway, when you think about the Lord speaking into our lives, man, look what he says. He's going to bring us out. Anyway, let this bad preacher on the radio. Boy, I had that thing turned up enough. He was wondering, I'm, I'm de I ain't deaf. Anyway, I listened to him and he says, when you come to the church house, and you don't know Jesus and you go to the altar, you come down there going to hell. But when you ask repentance and you leave that church and you leave that altar, you leave going to heaven. Yeah. Woo! Glory! Salvation brings all those things from going to hell to going to heaven. Wow! The woman at the well, after she drinks from this water, she says, Hey, come see a man that told me all ever I did. He is not this the Christ. No, no physical water did she get, but what she got was on the inside. And I mean that water filled her up until the whole town had a revival. How long has it been since you've had a big drink of Jesus? Woo! Why not just rear back and load up on the Lord one more time because there is life in this fountain. Woo! There's life there. In Proverbs chapter 11 and verse number 25, the scripture says, the liberal soul shall be made fat. And he that watereth shall be watered also himself. I'm going to ask Sister Williams and some of our singers if they'd come back if they can. I want us to sing that song in closing. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of our God. You water other people, you're going to get some water yourself. You're going to start growing. <clears throat> that song says, go tell it on the mountain. You tell somebody about Jesus, it's going to come back and speak into your life. <clears throat> this talks about the river. It also talks about, what's that other one? <clears throat> there's a fountain. Woo! And there's life in that fountain. You're going to like it when we get there. Mm -hmm. There is, is a river whose streams make glass. Amen. 
Emmanuel's face. Yes, there is a fountain that's full of grace, and it flows from Emmanuel's veins. and just rejoice for the water that the Lord has poured into our lives. When you get through praying, Brother Herschel, we'll dismiss you in a word of prayer. I'm going to go to jail.